In the last video, we focused on properties of waves, such as frequency, wavelength, and wave speed, and how they're related using the equation speed is equal to frequency times wavelength. We also talked about period and frequency and other things that are properties of the wave that help us know what we're talking about. Well, in this video, we're going to focus primarily on applications of waves. Specifically, we're going to look at the application of sound waves, but we're also going to get into a little bit of something called the standing wave uh, to set us up to talk about the physics of instruments uh, in the next video. So to start us off, um, it's important to know that all sound waves are going to start as some sort of vibration. Now, the source of that vibration can vary depending on how that sound wave is being produced. Right now, the sound of my voice is being created by my vocal cords vibrating back and forth at a certain frequency and smacking into the air molecules, causing them to vibrate as well. Um, a guitar string can vibrate. Um, other, way, uh, other ways that you can vibrate air um, through an instrument could be like the buzzing of a lips uh, in a brass instrument or the reed moving back and forth in a woodwind. Once that sound wave has started, it moves on as a pressure wave, areas of high pressure traveling along. Notice how the particle um, in this wave diagram is vibrating back and forth parallel to the direction that the wave is actually traveling. That means that we would define this as a longitudinal wave rather than a transverse wave where the particles vibrate per perpendicular. Um, a longitudinal wave, the particles will vibrate parallel, kind of like dominoes carrying along. Now the way that that actually travels requires a medium that if I am talking, the uh, molecules that are right next to my vocal cords start vibrating, but then the ones next to them get smacked. And eventually this domino effect leads all the way to your eardrum uh, that starts vibrating. And then your brain can turn that into a signal that you experience as sound. Now what you're experiencing is the rate of that vibration. Um, so we can define that based on the frequency of our wave. Uh, if you've listened to music, you know that sound can happen at different pitches, that a high pitched sound, something like a piccolo or a flute would have a very high frequency. That means that there are many vibrations per second for that high pitched sound, a low pitched sound like a bass drum or a tuba will have a very low frequency. And that is what we're experiencing as sound, not usually as a pure bell tone, there is just one frequency, it's usually some combination of frequencies that are built in a more complex sound. But what we're experiencing as our sound is related to that frequency. And that frequency that we can experience changes as we age. A human has a hearing range, um, kind of baseline, roughly 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. 20 hertz uh, is something vibrating 20 times every second, which seems pretty fast, but in terms of sound, that's really, really slow. That's almost slow enough that you could see it in a subwoofer moving back and forth. If you've been to a concert with giant subwoofers that, that are the size of a person, um, it's possible that you've experienced a sound that is lower than that. Um, you're not experiencing it as sound though. Uh, at some concerts, they are emitting sounds, pressure waves that are below 20 Hertz that you can feel in just your shirt vibrating. You can feel it in your body, uh, but your ears aren't sensing that as a sound signal. So these pressure waves within this range, we can interpret as sound. Other than that, they still exist. We just don't call them sound. Now let's test to see where our hearing is at, because like I said, hearing changes with age. So first, I'm going to play a bell tone that is at 8,000 hertz, and I'm going to play it starting right now. So most likely, you are all able to hear that sound. Uh, that sound is, is a high sound, for sure, but it's not too high that people will typically drop off just yet. But if I start increasing it, we're going to start seeing some drop off. So here's 10,000 hertz. All right, here is 12,000 Hertz. Here is 14,000 Hertz. And for the record, I was not able to hear that sound. So I had drop off somewhere between 12,000 and 14,000 Hertz. Um, but I'm going to keep playing 
uh, these tones so that you can see how high your hearing goes. This is or 16,000 hertz starting now. All right. This is 18,000 hertz starting now. My audio mixer tells me that I am playing the sound uh, even though I can't hear it. I haven't been able to hear it for a little while. And then finally, here's 20,000 hertz starting now. Okay, most likely you weren't able to hear 20,000 hertz. Most people drop off somewhere between 16, 14, and 18, kind of in that range. Um, and as you age, your high end starts to diminish. Um, well, typically this uh, is seen as a negative thing, but there are some applications that people have found, um, like for example, uh, a very popular ringtone that was going around several years back was something called the Mosquito, which was just a simple bell tone at about 16 or 17,000 hertz, a pitch that every student in a classroom would be able to hear, but no adults, no teachers would. Uh, so it was advertised as a detection-free sort of ringtone that students wouldn't get in trouble if they were using. But I've also seen this used to the detriment of people that can hear it. Um, I've seen it used as a loitering deterrent at different parks uh, after sundown that they'll play in a speaker uh, at a picnic shelter a tone at about 17,000 hertz that would deter any teenagers from hanging around uh, that picnic shelter after dark but wouldn't prevent adults from doing the same. So your uh, sensing of frequency changes as you grow, um, grow older. Now I wanna focus at what this frequency uh, looks like in terms of an instrument's design. Uh, a very famous group that you've probably heard of is the Blue Man Group, and they are very famous for creating instruments made out of unconventional material. So I want you to watch this clip of them playing one of their PVC instruments and pay attention to how the sound changes according to the instrument's design. It gets pretty intense there towards the end, but what you probably noticed is the longer the tube was, the lower the note um, that it produced was. Um, this is because the note being produced is being uh, produced in that is something called a standing wave, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And the longer the tube is, the longer the wavelength is going to be. And a longer wavelength, as long as the, the sound is traveling at the same speed, results in a lower frequency. You experience less of those sound waves per second than you would a shorter wavelength. So the longer the instrument, the lower the note. So let's talk about what a standing wave is. Um, a standing wave is a wave that is interfering with itself to produce this repeating pattern um, that is going back and forth like this. So you'll see um, there are places where it's not moving, uh, but there are places that it's moving quite a bit a standing wave is hard to draw like this. Obviously, this is in motion. So instead, we're going to draw it more like this for our standing wave. Now, to be fair, this looks like there's two ropes or two strings or two waves that are happening. And there is only just one overall wave. It's just oscillating between these two positions. So I've colored them here green and red. Um, but you can see that this is the same idea as this. It's just showing that is oscillating between those two positions. We can name a couple parts of this. Notice how there are some parts, even between the two positions, that there is no change. We call these nodes. A node is an area of no amplitude at all. Um, if you had a standing wave that was being produced by a slinky or a rope, you'd be able to go and physically just pinch in that spot on that rope, and it wouldn't affect the standing wave at all because that part wasn't going up and down anyway. The other part we call the anti-note. That's the area of the maximum vibration vibration that we're seeing, the maximum and the minimum showing up there, a crest and a trough. So we can take this and we can um, quantify them a little bit to ultimately lead us to a wavelength. Now, the way that we're gonna count these standing waves 
is by looking at the number of antinodes. Uh, if you can imagine that you are a jump roper, it's where you would jump rope in that standing wave. And my ultimate dream is to someday retire from being a teacher and start a jump roping troop called the Standing Waves, where we can have two, three, or four people jump roping all in one rope in their own little jump roping bubble. Um, so those are counting the number of standing waves. Counting the number of wavelengths is different than counting the number of standing waves. If you remember a wavelength is when the wave goes uh, from one maximum to the minimum and back. Um, so if we look at just one part of this wave, just the blue or just the red, we see that for this two standing wave picture, it goes up, down, and back. That is actually one full wavelength there. So two standing waves produces one wavelength. Because remember, drawing the two, the two lines here, that's just showing the oscillation. Just imagine that it's one uh, and count the number of waves that way. So if there is one wavelength here and the end to end distance is 12 meters, that would be a wavelength of 12. That one wavelength in 12 meters is a 12 meter wavelength. If we look instead at number one, uh, so the number of standing waves is one, that would mean that it's only half of a wavelength. If there's half a wavelength in 12 meters, then the wavelength is 24 uh, because it would take 24 meters for one complete wave to happen. If we look here at four standing waves, that would be two wavelengths. And uh, that would mean that there's a wavelength of six that fits in the 12 meters. So looking at this here then, three standing waves would mean that's actually one and a half wavelengths. You'll notice that the number of wavelengths is always half the number of standing waves. Go ahead and predict what would the wavelength have to be for one and a half waves to fit into 12 meters. So if one wavelength is here and then another half, really there's three standing waves in 12, each standing wave is four meters, two standing waves produce one wavelength, so that would be eight meters for a standing wave. We can see standing waves um, in action if we can visualize the pressure or the amplitude of the wave. Typically, you can't see a sound wave, but uh, if you can get crafty with how that air is being visualized, you can actually see it. All right, so this video here is showing something called a Rubens tube. A Rubens tube is basically a metal tube with a bunch of tiny holes pricked in the top that you pump full of a flammable gas like propane. And it basically works as like hundreds of tiny Bunsen burners. Well, flame is going to extend further out of the tube in areas of high air pressure. Now, high air pressure is the antinode of the wave. So if you produce a sound signal down one end of the pipe, you will see a standing wave forming where the antinode, the high pressure is always in the same spot. So here, you can see how when he changes the frequency of this wave, it changes the shape of the standing wave that forms in his Rubens tube. You can also visualize a standing wave for a wave that actually isn't sound, but rather an electromagnetic wave like a microwave. Inside your microwave at home, it's producing a standing wave in the microwave wavelength of electromagnetic waves, which means that there are some spots in your microwave that are hot spots and some spots that are cold spots. One of the reasons that you have a turntable in there is so that it can pass through the antinodes and not be stuck in a node the entire time. If you take a tray of peeps or cheese or chocolate chips and set it so that your um, turntable is off and then microwave it for like 30 seconds, you'll see that some areas melt while others don't. You can actually use that to determine what the speed of light is um, by measuring the wavelength in that standing wave. So in this lesson, uh, you should be able to walk away being able to relate the pitch of a sound to the frequency. And we experience different frequencies uh, and how that changes based on an instrument or based on our hearing. Uh, and then you can identify and label the node and antinode, as well as count uh, how many standing waves and what the wavelength is going to be from a standing wave diagram.